together. I want to just start the day by having a little bit of a reflection about courage and how that helps our heart to expand and include more of life and our emotions and feelings. And it's quite interesting because the word courage comes from the root kur, which is a French word, and in French it actually means heart. So here we're not talking about the physical, autonomical heart, but um, the heart is the kind of seat of our inner world and the thoughts and feelings and emotions that move through it. Um, there's a very nice quote I found by someone, I don't know who this person is, they're called Anai Nin. Um, and she or he says, uh, life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. And I thought this was a very nice kind of overview of what courage means, because obviously when we practice, we need to start to open to more and more of the truth of this moment, of the reality of this moment. And having courage helps us to expand into life rather than kind of shrink away from difficulties and obstacles. We're actually able to lean towards them. And therefore, there's a very big opportunity to develop insight. So when the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, he taught not only that there is suffering and that there's a cause, that there's a way out and that there's a path, but he taught that these are to be experienced. So there is suffering, but suffering is to be understood. So for some people this sounds perhaps challenging, you know, because when we have to meet suffering, it, cha it's, it goes against our conditioning. We're conditioned to avoid and pull back from difficult experiences. But you can't really understand an experience or let go of suffering or the sort of mental knots that we create without actually meeting them first of all. So we have to bring them into our conscious awareness and then, then only we can release them from our grasp. So as long as the heart remains tight and contracted, it's almost, you can imagine like a hand grasping onto an experience. It becomes very uh, tight and difficult to let go of, knotty. So courage helps to give this uh, space, a sense of spaciousness in which there's a kind of container for things to be held so that they can arise within that space, but then pass through. We can let them go more easily. I was recently on a, um, a little insight and yoga retreat, and one of the teachers there said something very lovely, which I thought related to this. She said, uh, when we're vulnerable, we're actually protected. And that's because we have enough space to be able to allow things to be held and move, move through. And often we kind of shy away from vulnerability and create these kind of layers around the heart and layers of defense or, you know, just areas where we get stuck and we tend to think that, okay, that's the edge of my potential or, you know, my capacity to face something. But I think with courage we're able to, help us to meet those areas and to maybe soften into them. And when you do this and you allow the experience to be felt, often you realize it's just a sensation, it's just a feeling, it's just a mood. It arises and passes away, but it's the grasping that makes it so painful and the resistance. So it's almost that there's more suffering in the disconnection than there is in the actual experience. Even yesterday I was staying with some lovely friends in um, Kenley and uh, we talked about this a little bit in the evening and, uh, and she said it was a relief last night because I looked at her and I thought, gosh, she's tired. And when she realized that, it was, it was like, oh yeah, now I can kind of connect with my body and know what I need. And before that, she'd be just running, 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 you know, trying to do everything. <laughs> so courage isn't really a bravado thing. It's not, um, you know, sort of trying to face everything and, uh, and have an appearance of fearlessness. It's actually, it's more a softening and a realizing that, okay, there's fear or there's tiredness. Nevertheless, I'm going to move into that experience. So it's not this stereotypical masculine kind of, you know, bravado, which may look like courage, but it can actually be a mask for insecurity. And there's an amazing story that I read while I was at a local vihara, actually, in a book called Women of Courage. And you may have heard of it. I'm probably out of date with the story, but um, the, the man who played Superman in uh, Superman movies, um, <laughs> you know, he was the, I guess, symbol of courage to many people, but he had a tragic accident and, and actually fell off a horse and broke his neck and became paralyzed. And his wife was uh, recounting the story and saying that um, 
when this happened, it was the worst fear, you know, it's the worst thing that can possibly happen to anybody. But somehow she went into a different zone. It was like love just came up and a kind of resource that she didn't know she had. And, and something kind of carried her through this experience. So she started phoning to his mother, to his father, you know, and relaying this news. And she was really holding things, not even holding them together, but she felt like something else came through. And she said uh, the most touching thing for her was to see her son's reaction. He was only, I think, I don't know if he was two or four, so let's say he was three. <laughs> um, and he was so afraid, you know, when he heard his daddy's paralyzed, basically. He didn't want to see his daddy because he thought, maybe it's not my daddy anymore, you know. Um, and he kept playing over the tragedy physically. So he had this little rocking horse and he was, you know, playing on it and then falling off and going, oh, my neck, my neck. And she was saying it was really painful, you know, to watch this, but it was his way of processing things. And then eventually he mustered up the courage to go and see his father. I don't know if he, I think he was still in hospital at the time. And when he went into the room, his face lit up because it's like, Daddy, it's still Daddy. And it was that overcoming, you know, that fear that gave him this huge amount of joy actually started to come up. I've, I've done it, I've faced it. And she said, it was really amazing to see how his behavior changed. So before he was just kind of learning to swim with armbands and whatever you call it in America, floats and stuff. And suddenly he started diving into the water, swimming underneath. You know, he had this complete fearlessness. So I think this is really an inspiring story, you know, that even the worst thing that can happen to us actually can become, it can kind of help us to tap into resources we never knew we had. But, yeah, kind of ironic that he was the Superman in the movies, but perhaps the real kind of strength, the real Superman was living with this terrible tragedy and turning it into a strength, giving his family the courage to love. So courage is motivated by love. It can also be motivated by um, wish to serve our values, you know, kind of getting in contact with our deeper values in life and trying to align ourselves to those. So I think one important aspect of courage is truth and authenticity. <laughs> I love these two words. Um, so, you know, truth, because we have to, in order for the path to deepen, we have to uncover whatever is untrue and inauthentic and what is fabricated or constructed, if you like. So it's part of the process towards getting to those deeper, uncovering those deeper fabrications is living a life of truth at the behavioral, verbal, heart level aligning ourselves to our values and um, you know for example can you just show up the way you are right now you know? can we just be here together and without any expectation without feeling we have to be good meditators or stay awake all day or you know not cross our legs or fidget can we just come unprepared I'm still learning that one <laughs> cram all this stuff in my mind and then hope it works <laughs> Can we come nervous or sad? Can we just be how we are and feel that that's okay, you know? We can include all those parts of ourselves, because they're all parts of us. <laughs> so the courage gives us that capacity to be able to intimately acquaint ourselves with all our different parts and bring them in. So it's expanding the capacity to experience. And like I say, this is so important, because if we don't experience and understand suffering, it's not possible to to let it go. First we need to see how it's caused, how it arises and what leads to its dissolution. Of course I think with courage too it's not this, like I say, masculine sort of bravado, like let's just forge in there and get right into the heart of the difficulty. I think courage is also very gentle and goes in gradually, incrementally. So there was this um, experience I had recently, I was in uh, Gaia House Maybe I wasn't going to say that on the tape because <laughs> I was actually feeding the birds from my window. <laughs> so there were these knots. <laughs> so actually, it wasn't my idea, but the, one of the ladies, <laughs> one of the ladies that was staying there, she um, left and she said, "I've got this tub of bird food. Can you continue to feed them?" So I thought, "Oh, it could be distracting, but let me give it a go anyway." It was probably a bit distracting, but very interesting. So these birds were coming. And at first, only certain birds would come, like this one blue tit. There were two blue tits, but one of them had like more punk kind of hair or feathers. And that one was really bold. <laughs> so that one used to come like straight away and take the knots. 
and the other ones didn't dare, or they'd only come when I wasn't near the window, you know. But then after a while they would come even if I was near the window. And after a while they came even when the window was open. And then all these unusual birds started coming, like birds I've never seen with like, like little, they were all little birds, but one had like a long, because I've not lived in England for a long time, so you probably know this bird, I don't know. It's got like a long beak. I don't know if it was a mini woodpecker or something. <laughs> and then they started to come. And eventually, one of them actually started to come inside the window. And the little punky blue tit started to eat off my hand. And it was just really interesting to see how they built up this courage. But based on reward, okay, you know. Maybe that's not the best motivation. But I think it's the same in practice. You know, first of all, we come only to the outside of the window, like we have this window around the heart, say a wall or covering, layers, shields. So we come just a little bit close. And then it's okay, we feel okay about that. In fact, there's a bit of release. And then the next step is to come a little bit inside the wall. And eventually we can come right inside and we find deeper and deeper riches inside. So it's like even the hindrances become gateways to deeper insight and freedom. I mean, the more we can meet, the more potential there is for freedom from whatever we meet, right? We've understood it. We've understood how it's arising. It doesn't have the same hold. We understand that it's impermanent, that it's not me. It's just the play of the five khandhas. I'm presuming people know the five khandhas, so does anyone not know? So the five khandhas are the way that the Buddha breaks down our experience in the mental and physical realm. So basically there are five aspects, you could say, to experience. It's one way to see it. There's other, as other ways also. So he said there's body or matter. Then there's feeling, which can be mental feeling or physical sensation. Then there's perception. So first we have the feeling, then we perceive the feeling. So we know, okay, this is hot, this is cold. It labels or it sometimes gives an evaluation also. And then there's the reaction. To that. You can see this happening in the practice. You have a feeling, say pain or tightness. Ooh, that's pain. I don't like it. I have to get rid of it. That's the reaction. So he calls that sankara. And that's actually where the kama is made. So depending if we react to that, you know, some people if they feel, I don't know, tired or a bit agitated, it leads to anger. So it's the anger that leads to our actions, and if those actions are fueled by anger, they often have negative consequences. So karma is actually the action, and the result would be the negative consequences. And then sankara and vijnana, which is consciousness. So all these kind of condition the consciousness. Not only the consciousness may be from a past life, if you believe in the past lives or not, or can consider that that might be so, but also the consciousness in each moment is conditioned by our feeling, our perception, our reaction to it. And the Buddha said, uh, of all these five khandhas, which basically represent our existence, they're all impermanent, so they come and go. So feeling he likened to winds that come and go, like winds from the four directions, hot winds, cold winds. You can't control them, you know, they're completely out of control. They just come. And if you don't grab them, they, you know, you can't grab the air. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I mean, he gave similes for all of them, which I won't go into now, but basically they're impermanent, so that's very easy to see with feelings, thoughts, emotions. And they're also suffering. So he said whatever is impermanent is suffering, because it's passing away. It's passing away all the time. So even the pleasant experiences, you know, if we try to grasp those experiences, we struggle because the mind contracts, and they pass away. So, we're, you know, when they've gone... Again, you're suffering. <laughs> and then the, the last characteristic he talked about was that these are not self. And the way he describes this to get it across to people is that if they were self, we'd be able to say, may it be this way, may it be that way. May I experience only pleasant, may I experience everything going my way at work or you know, in life. But we can't because they're not self and they are impermanent. So we can't have of sensations or perceptions, may they be this way, may they be that way. So this, this was actually the Buddha's um, second teaching to uh, the monk, well, the people who came to him for teaching, who later became monks after he was enlightened, and 
they became fully enlightened through this teaching. So anyway, I wanted to get on to a little bit more about um, how the Buddha described um, ways to overcome timidity, because I think courage only really comes to the fore when there's fear present in the mind, or when there's something that's kind of on the edge of our comfort zone. And um, the only place I found uh, some of the Buddha's teachings on this are in the Anguttara Vinikaya, which is um, a collection of discourses that are kind of ordered according to numbers. So there'll be the four this, and the three this, and the five this. So this is one of the fives. So it's quite easy to remember. So there's five things. So there's five ways of overcoming timidity. And um, I kind of think of these as the sort of far enemy of courage. Like you could see bravado as kind of uh, the near enemy. It kind of masquerades as courage, so it looks similar. But timidity is almost the, the opposite. It's a kind of, I don't want to go there. So what is it that helps us to overcome timidity and thus create courage in our mind? So the first thing that the Buddha said was um, virtue, if you like to translate it that way. And I think this is very beautiful because when we cultivate virtue in our hearts, we're basically cultivating a sense of harmlessness. We're trying our best not to harm ourselves, not to harm others. And that gives others the gift of trust. Even animals start to trust you. you know? They can tell if you, if you want to hurt them or not. At first they might be afraid, but they can tell. And they say that people with you know, a lot of sila tend to attract good people tend to have that influence on people because people can trust you, they feel safe they know you, they're not going to you're not going to tell all their stories that they've confided in you to other people in an attempt to you know, turn people against you or anything like this and um, I think it's a really important part of the practice to bring to mind all the things we do which are kind and which do lead to developing a good heart and to actually reflect on that so in the Buddha's teaching, there's something called chaganusati, which literally means reflecting on one's... I guess chaga means giving. It means giving. But sila is a kind of giving. And it starts with generosity. So a kind of giving away and giving up of self-concern means that we think of, the, of others as well and how our behaviors affect others. And it's the first step, in a way, of letting go. You know, First we let go of our intentions to harm or we maybe let go of material things. We feel we want to give to a, another cause that helps more people. Um, and then later on, this same movement of the mind can lead us towards giving up more difficult things. So maybe we give up speaking badly of others. In meditation, we might even come to the stage where we give up our body <laughs> in deep meditation. And then we give up our clinging. So sila is the first step in this, and we cultivate sila. So it gives us that sense of courage. And I know for me this was um, really important when I was traveling in India. I was only about 19 or 20, and uh, traveled on my own most of the time, took local buses on long journeys, you know, through really dangerous parts, actually. If I'd have known, <laughs> I probably would have still gone. But, <laughs> but if I would have told my mother, she'd have, uh, yeah have had a very sleepless night. So I used to get on these buses and there would always, always be a bit of trepidation. But then I'd reflect, you know, I'm on a... I just felt like I was there on a kind of pilgrimage. I didn't know yet quite what for, but I was looking for meaning and I was looking for a way to develop compassion in my life and to understand suffering and how to free myself from that and to help others free themselves. And that knowledge gave me the confidence to go on these buses because I knew that I'm going through a you know, a good cause in a way. Like this journey has a meaning and it's, yeah, sort of felt led. So I always trusted in that intention and I think this is also important to kind of reflect on our intentions very much and reflect on how we can plant good seeds in our hearts and, you know, some of the seeds we've already planted in our hearts and how those good intentions lead to good results. This can give us confidence when difficult things come up. Because we know, okay, this difficult thing that's arising now, it could be the result of something I've done before, but if I meet this experience with kindness and with compassion and with gentleness and the right attitude, you know, not taking it as me or something permanent, 
then we can develop courage and because we know that we're not creating new causes for suffering in the future. You know, whenever you put something good in, it's like watering a plant, you know, you know it's going to grow. It's only a matter of time. So this gives us courage. So then the second one is um, confidence. And I think here it probably refers to confidence in the Buddha's teachings and confidence in our own capacity to actualize those teachings, to walk on the path and benefit and ultimately to realize what the Buddha realized. Um, and I think Sada, I think Sharon Salzburg talked about it in her book, I'd never heard this, but it means to place one's heart upon something. So it's a kind of being able to trust, being able to give something over to something greater that can hold. And I think wisdom, you know, wisdom and, and confidence have to be balanced. And wisdom kind of pertains more to the known field, it can, pertains to sort of meeting, experiencing the present and discerning what's happening. And confidence kind of gives us courage to go into the unknown field. It's somewhere we've not been before. So we have a sense that perhaps, you know, this would be good for me. I'm not quite sure, but if I just go that little further. And confidence in the teachings and in the Buddha can help us to move beyond the known. So there's kind of two kinds of confidence. It's translated sometimes as faith, but I, d I like to avoid that word because it, the first kind is a kind of um, uh, inspired confidence, I like to call it. It's sort of when you meet teachers that inspire you, that have been further on the path than you, and you see the results, you know, you see the results in their behavior, in the way they make you feel when you're around them. And it gives you a sense that, oh, maybe they're just showing me my own potential. Maybe what I see in them is actually myself. It's always that way, actually. <laughs> and so you have a sense that there's something there. You haven't realized it yourself, but you have confidence. And I think good friends also can help to give you this confidence. For me, a good friend is someone who knows you in all your different manifestations, not only on a good day, you know, but somebody who knows your weaknesses too. But they tend not to define you by that. A good friend doesn't define you by the difficult or the, you know, parts of you that are still, I don't know, that you still struggle with. They see your potential and they try to nurture that. So in this way it helps us to build confidence in ourselves and confidence in the Dhamma. But then there's another kind of confidence which is verified confidence and this is when we actually experience some of these teachings for ourselves. And then we have what's called a kind of unshakable confidence. And this happens actually with a penetration into those truths of suffering and the way out at the first stage of enlightenment. So at that point, I mean, you're, you're just confident, you know. I think there's, there's no need for courage anymore. It's almost a given. And it's also a foundation for the deeper levels of practice, which then start to happen automatically from that ground. So then the third one is uh, learning which is interesting. I was wondering why learning should help us to develop courage or overcome timidity. But then I thought of an example in my own life, which um, happened uh, in Amravati, actually. Um, and something came up for me on that retreat, triggered by an event that kind of disturbed me. And all this anxiety started to come up. I didn't really understand at first why there was such a, a big kind of outpouring of anxiety. I really was trembling, you know, and, and for a long time. And I knew it was not proportional to what had happened, so I realized it must have been linked to something that happened before, like a past trauma. And at the time, I was reading a really wonderful book by Peter Levine called um, Waking the Tiger. And he talked about how when animals are attacked in nature, they either have a fight-flight response, or if they, you know, are flawed, so to speak, and they actually, you know, just, they play dead. But when they come out of this, like their body goes into shock, but when they come out of it, they start to tremble. And it's a natural response that releases the stress and releases the shock. And so he does a kind of therapy, I think there are other teachers too, who do a kind of physical practice that sort of causes you to tremble and causes this sh sort of shock to come out. And it was the same thing happening in me. I realized there had been something stuck, and now it was calming out. So when I realized that, I thought, oh, this is good for me. And it took away that, what the Buddha calls the second arrow, which is, 
you have an experience which is unpleasant, and then you react to it, and you actually increase the unpleasantness by reacting, you know, you're actually just building suffering for yourself. So the second arrow was taken out, and basically I just had the trembling, and I stayed with it the whole night, and okay, making peace. Okay, I'd prefer to go to sleep, but okay, I'm probably not going to go to sleep now, it's three o'clock, I'm lying here and I'm relaxing, and it's good for me. No expectation of result, I was just with it, you know, going through my body, mentally, feeling everything. And the next morning, um, I went to breakfast and afterwards met a, one of the other nuns, and I just realised I was so bright and joyful and alive in a way I hadn't felt for a long time. It was like something had been unleashed and it gave me a new burst of life. <laughs> so that was amazing and I, I did feel very confident because I also knew I'd increased my capacity to face this kind of feeling in the body. And if next time it would happen I would know that this is nothing to fear. So that's, I think, an example of how learning can help. And of course, learning also links into one of the aspects of courage, which I think is curiosity. Because I think when we kind of meet things with a curious attitude, like, what's happening here? You know, oh, this is really interesting. Let me have a look. Our mind's much more open, you know, rather than saying, OK, this is something that I know already. This always happens. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe it's different this time. OK, it's anger. It's the same old anger, but... How does it look this time? You know, how does it actually feel? Because when you look inside, you find that these things are composed of sensations, thoughts. They're built up. They're constructed. And often they're accompanied by a tightening. And as soon as you kind of look in with a curious and inquisitive, maybe even a playful mind, you know, something opens up. It's like, oh, I'm taking a step back and I'm looking at something happening. This is really interesting. So it's like in Zen they call it beginner's mind. And you basically start from a premise of not knowing. So instead of going in and saying, I know what to expect, I know where this is going, you know, it's always like this. I don't know, what's this? Let me see. So it's something you see in children very much, you know, say when they're playing with sand or building a sandcastle. They're not worried about how the sandcastle's going to look. They're not worried about will it last long or anything like this. Or They're just really in there with the sand and enjoying it. And, oh, what can I do with my hands? What can I do, you know, by putting the sun here, make a little turret or something. Like how's it, they're just in there with it, enjoying the process. So I think this is also part of um, learning to have courage to make mistakes, you know, and realising that things are just a process, like life is a field of learning and we, we just open to that and, and, you know, take every experience as an opportunity to learn. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you learn just as much either way. So there's no... Uh, no way to lose, really. So I think this is where learning can come in and give us confidence. The next one is energy. But in a way, this energy sometimes pertains to energy in a physical way, but I think the Buddha's pointing more towards energy in the spiritual practice. And again, interesting with the courage, because I don't think it's about having this kind of really powerful, strong, full power energy that's just always, you know, ready for anything and goes in and conquers battles and defeats Mara and all this. It's more a spiritual energy. So the root of energy is Vera, which means hero. So it's a spiritual hero. It's not the hero that goes in and like, yay, I've won, I've won the war or battle or whatever. It's a spiritual hero. So a spiritual hero is somebody who lets go. It's like, I give everything I've got to this practice right now. I give even when it's difficult. Even when I think I can't take another step, you know, I just take one more step. It's this kind of giving, giving away, which links into the noble truth of, well, the truth of giving up, which is the third um, noble truth. It's uprooting the craving, the way out of suffering. So those are giving away, relinquishing, not letting things stick. So you give to the practice, you give your whole heart to every breath as if this might be our last breath. So this is the kind of energy that the Buddha's talking about, and meeting it again and again and again. And also they say that energy um, in meditation is quite different from worldly energy, like physical energy, because the more we rouse it, the more that comes. It's not like there's a limited amount. The more energy you put in, the more energy keeps coming, like a cup of uh, coffee, you know, refill. It just keeps getting refilled all the time. 
So I think this kind of energy is very beautiful, but you need to put it into the mind and the awareness, not into the doing. So in meditation, often we're very busy with, you know, doing our technique or kind of, okay, I need to try harder with the breath or I need to put my attention here. Ajahn Brahm, my teacher, always says, you take the energy away from the, no from the doer and put it into the knower. It's just a way of speaking. There is no knower as such. It's a knowing. It's a process of knowing. But you take it away from this kind of part of you that wants to get involved and meddle around. and I call it like sticky fingers. Like you want to, okay, what's going on now? <laughs> so it's putting it into the knowing mind and infusing that mind with compassion and kindness as well. So this is real energy. And then the last one, I think we're okay for time, is um, wisdom. So obviously wisdom is going to give us courage. And wisdom's function is basically to uncover the three main areas of delusion. So the areas into which we are deluded. And the Buddha talked about these as linked to the three characteristics that I talked about before. So it's taking what is suffering to be not suffering, or taking what is impermanent to be permanent. You know, like we think we're going to last forever. We know we're not in our head, but we think we are. <laughs> we can't imagine not being here, right? And then the last one is taking what is not self as self. So, oh, these are my thoughts, this is my emotions. It's not. It's a phenomenon, it's causally ori ori originated, and it passes. So wisdom's job is to uncover these areas and to understand suffering as suffering. And suffering always has grasping involved. <laughs> and then to understand what's impermanent as impermanent. And likewise, what's not self as not self. So we stop identifying with these five candors you know, this body-mind process. So I think, uh, you know, wisdom leads to happiness and contentment, but also to a letting go. And the point of practice is not to kind of get some kind of wisdom. It's always to ask, you know, am I, how am I meeting this experience? Am I meeting it with a wise attitude that leads towards a release? Or am I building up suffering for myself? So I want to just talk about wisdom and give the example of fear, because I think fear is very related to courage in this context. Because we only really need to be courageous if there's fear present. If there's no fear, it's not really courageous. You know, my mother used to say, oh, you're so brave going to Asia. And it kind of felt like, mm, not really, it didn't really feel that way to me. It felt like I had to go, I was called, you know. So there was no fear as such. In fact, there was quite an exhilaration. So it wasn't really about courage. Maybe there was some courage, but it was something I had to do, I was called to do. So fear is a really interesting one. And as long as we basically feel that there's a self, then we're going to naturally have fear, it's inevitable, because there's something to protect, there's something we need to protect and we need to preserve. You know, It's the same with um, things that belong to a self. So whenever there's a self, there's also things that we misappropriate and we think this is my... I don't know, lunch. I lost my lunch. <laughs> I brought, well, the people I stayed with had uh, made me a lovely lunch. I'm hoping I'm going to find it, but um, for now it seems to have disappeared. So if I thought that was my lunch, I'd be a bit, I'd be starting to get hungry. <laughs> but anyway, it's not my lunch, so if someone's found it, that's great. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, yeah, and also, I think, um, when you look at other kinds of what you call afflictive states of mind, you often find fears underneath them, actually. Like, if you think about craving or wanting to acquire, it's often fear of not having enough. You know? Not having enough uh, the physical level, not having enough mental resources, maybe. You know, or what happens if I'm ever in this situation, I won't be able to cope, I'll get depressed. It's this fear of losing something. Or even losing, you know, a good self-image that we try so hard to build up in people's minds <laughs> all the time. We want to present ourselves a certain way, and we're always afraid to lose that, afraid to lose our reputation, you know, or our fame, maybe, if, if you're on the stage somewhere. <laughs> um, and also at the root of anger, 
Yeah, I think often there's fear there. There's other emotions too, like sadness, I think, is often at the root of anger. But also a kind of fear, you know, like uh, I'm getting angry because I need to defend myself. Someone's going to hurt me or there's an injustice, you know, and I'm afraid. What's that going to do? What's going to happen in the world? So fear, coming in contact with it, requires coming in contact with our, vulnerable, our vulnerability. You know, it's a place that, where we don't know. And I think one of the main fears is the fear of the unknown, you know, so it tends to keep us stuck in the field of what we already know. There's that phrase, better the devil you know. People always say it, I can't stand it. <laughs> you know, like even with politics, <laughs> oh, well, at least we know. I mean, we haven't got Margaret Thatcher now, but, you know. <laughs> so it's like, stick with that one, because at least we know what they're going to do, even if it's not for the benefit of all beings. <laughs> so it keeps us stuck. It's the same thing as doubt. Doubt's a kind of fear. It kind of has a crippling effect on the mind, and it stops us taking the next step. And it's so unpleasant to feel stuck, you know. You're sort of in this sense of confusion and not knowing what to do next and afraid to take the next step. I got into that situation myself for um, probably two or three years. I came to the point where I wasn't really sure what would happen next in my spiritual path or whether I'd find conducive places or situations to practice in or even whether there was still enough joy. And I wasn't really sure what to do, but I knew don't act yet, you know, because there's not enough clarity. And one of my teachers was actually very helpful. I talked to him about this, and he said, the thing is, it's very important to remember that you're not stuck. You're not stuck. Just remember that. And I took that back with me to the place I was staying at the time, and I just remembered it, you know. So whenever I couldn't figure out where I'm going, I can't see the way ahead, it's like, remember you're not stuck, even when it feels like I am. You can't be. Life continues, you know. Even when we come to the end of a relationship or the end of a job, a career, we're not stuck. And now for me it's incredible because, you know, at one point I had to make the decision not to go back to Australia. And at that time I didn't know, I didn't have anywhere to stay here. It was only last January. And um, I had my ticket back. And, uh, and my abbot actually at the monastery said, I think you should stay. You know, Ajahn Pram's coming and you need to organise his tour. And I said, yes, yes, I know, but um, I understand that, and I, I, I know it would be good, but I'm just not ready. I just, you know, I, I couldn't sleep, actually, at the time. It was such a wrenching decision. So, you know, it was the fear of the unknown, and luckily I kind of knew to go with it. I think sometimes it's hard for us to differentiate between that and our intuition. You know, if there's a difficult feeling, we think, is that my intuition telling me not to go not to stay and to go back because this is too unpleasant. But it wasn't because I looked inside at what I value and what I want to give my life's energy to and I found, no, I want to give it to creating opportunities for women to practice. And I also want to give it to going with whatever's asked of me from my teacher. It's also a kind of confidence. It's a place in my heart upon his wishes or his vision, you know, and being aligned with it very much. But trusting, you know, that there'll be enough support and there'll be enough inspiration through that. So that gave me the strength, but at the time I felt like, you know, brick wall. <laughs> Just brick wall. And it's lovely to meet these walls and realise there's a whole life beyond it. And I think it's the same in the practice. There's a whole life, a whole inner life beyond our conditioned, ingrained habits. And unless we meet those habits and dare to just inquire what's happening here, you know, can I just meet this and hold it with kindness? Awareness and kindness are important. Aware of what's happening, what's happening here. Kindness, how can I care for this? How can I care for myself, for my mind? Hold it gently. And then see where it leads us. So hopefully in this way we can come to our full potential as practitioners on the path. So I think I need to wind up now and um, just wish all of you to take something from this day and even have that little bit more courage in a very gentle, compassionate way to just meet yourself and hold yourself just the way you are and just relax into being for the day together. Thank you. <laughs>